Okay, let's start. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sam Grushevsky from uh, uh, Stony Brook University in the United States, and Sam will talk about geometry of modular spaces of cubic threefolds. Uh, thank you, Sam. So thank you for having me. Thank you all for joining. So the way I see the screen, I do see the chat. So in principle, I might be able to see your questions in chat. But since I am using this setup to teach calculus and nobody answers except in chat, I would much prefer if you actually unmute yourselves and ask verbally. Okay, so Sam, if, well, if you wish, I can actually interrupt you and read questions. It's up no, to it's you. okay. Well, I, mean, I hopefully will read them, but I would prefer to actually see people speaking if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Zoom, so you know at some point I might lose internet connection. You might stop seeing me or stop hearing me. I hope that somebody, maybe Vanya, will complain immediately because I don't know what you're going to see. Uh, the most important thing I have to say is that this is joint work with uh, Sebastian, Jana, Tasalina, Martin, with Klaus Kulik and Radu Laza. And since this is a Zoom seminar, I don't really know what the audience's background is. Uh, so if some of this is too elementary, I hope you all are at home and comfortable and can have a cup of tea and wait while maybe it gets a little less elementary. On the other hand, if I go too fast, please do ask because I don't know what the right level is and what right speed is, and the feedback would be greatly appreciated. It's good to see those of you who are concerned. So we're going to talk about the geometry of the modular space of cubic three folds, and everything I say will be over C, and most of this will fail miserably over other fields, so I don't want to go there. So X for me will be a smooth cubic three fold. So X is given by the vanishing of one equation. So F is a homogeneous cubic polynomial here. And if I have a homogeneous cubic polynomial in five homogeneous variables, it's zero locus in P4, in CP4 is a smooth cubic threefold. And the one thing you can try to study is the moduli of cubic threefold. Whenever you say moduli, this means parameter space. This means somehow the set of equivalence classes. And when you say cubic threefold, you start by considering smooth cubic threefolds. Okay, so it's a moduli space. Why do I think it's a moduli space? Well, because I can just think of this as the following. So what this is, this is a projectivization of the space of sections on P4 of O of three minus a certain discriminant locus. Discriminant locus is the locus where the corresponding cubic threefold is not going to be smooth. And then you take a quotient of this by the action of PGL five C, the group of projective linear transformations which move this. So what I'm using here is that if I have two cubic threefolds, complex cubic threefolds, which I'm going to think of as abstract algebraic varieties, I can ask when are they isomorphic. And what is implicitly being said here is that the only way that two cubic threefolds are isomorphic as algebraic varieties is if the defining equation for one can be moved to the defining equation for the other by an element of the linear group by projective transformation of the m -dot space. So this is a moduli space of smooth cubic threefolds. Why would you care about cubic threefolds? Well, there are many reasons. So that if you try to study varieties in general, maybe you start studying curves and then you see hundreds of thousands of papers, so I don't know how many, but many on moduli of curves. Then maybe you go to surfaces and you go to threefolds, and then in each dimension you can ask what are the sort of simplest varieties. So of course the projective space is simple, but it doesn't give you much for moduli space at one point. So you want to have some kind of interest in the family. Part of the reason cubic threefolds are interesting is because they are one of the simplest example of things on the one hand, on the other hand they're sufficiently rich. So one thing I'd like to point out is the dimension complex dimension of the moduli space of cubic threefolds is 10. You can do this computation by computing the dimension of the space of sections of bundles and the dimension of PGL, and this will all work out correctly. So you get an interesting 10 dimensional moduli space, which is a variety. Uh, this is very nice, but that's one thing you'd like to have some rich moduli to have some variations. 
Another thing is we'd like to have more interesting geometric constructions. The cubic three folds admit many interesting geometric constructions. So the first such is perhaps a construction which is really due to Clemens and Griffiths. And they pioneered in some sense the study of the geometry of cubic three folds and they looked at the intermediate Jacobian. So if I have a cubic three fold, so it's a smooth cubic three fold, three dimensional variety, its intermediate Jacobian is defined as the quotient of H to one dual of X by the lattice H3. So what this is, is this actually comes with a natural polarization. I, the intermediate Jacobian IJFX turns out to be a principally polarized abelian five-fold. I'm used to denoting the modular principally polarized abelian varieties by A. So this uh, intermediate Jacobian is an element of A5. I won't tell you in detail what the polarization is, but there is a natural polarization. And uh, there is maybe something interesting about this polarization. So the polarization here maybe is called theta. So theta is the polarization divisor here. And the uh, point zero, or there is uh, a singular point of theta. So there is only one singular point of this theta divisor. And the multiplicity of this singular point happens to be equal to three. And if you take the projectivized tangent cone to the theta divisor, sorry, at this point, you're going to recover the cubic threefold you started from. This is far from obvious, requires an explicit description of how to actually construct the intermediate Jacobian of a cubic threefold. But what this tells you is that if you have an intermediate Jacobian of a cubic threefold as a principally polarized abelian variety, by looking at this as a principally polarized abelian variety, you can look at the unique singular point of the theta divisor, the polarization divisor, and the projectivized tangent cone will give you back the cubic threefold. So what this tells you is this tells you that global Torelli holds. So Torelli, global Torelli holds for the intermediate Jacobian map. Which is to say that the moduli space of smooth cubic threefolds is embedded in the moduli space of five-dimensional principally polarized abelian varieties by the intermediate Jacobian map. That's what this means. Okay. The reason Clemens and Griffiths were really interested in this is because uh, uh, cubic threefolds were an example of a variety that was shown not to be rational but still being rational. The way you do this is you somehow check that your intermediate Jacobian is not a Jacobian. For a generic cubic threefold, the intermediate Jacobian of this cubic threefold is not a Jacobian. And this is the main result of Clements and Griffiths. But this is not the direction I want to go. I want to go in a different direction. I want to tell you a bit more about a different model for cubic threefold. So suppose I have a cubic threefold X, which remember is given by one equation F is equal to zero in P4. Given such an equation F defining a cubic threefold, I can consider a very particular cubic fourfold. So it will be a fourfold, so it will sit in P5, and it will be given by one equation, which I'm going to write as my new coordinate z, or maybe you want to call it, I don't know, x5 if you wish. Cube is equal to f. So f is a, a homogeneous polynomial in five homogeneous variables, and I can add one more variable, and I can just write down the equation. The cube of this variable is equal to f, and this will give me a cubic fourfold in P5. So this is not just any cubic fourfold, it's a cubic fourfold on which z mod three, or if you wish mu three will act, because I can multiply x five, the coordinate x five by a root of unity, and this will preserve the cubic fourfold. But this also means that this cubic fourfold I can think of as a triple branch cover of P4, which is going to branch precisely along x. This is an equivalent description of what this cubic fourfold is, but I want to write a formula. Then, given this uh, cubic fourfold, 
you can look at the final surface of lines on it. So you look at all lines which lie on this cubic four. You can study this variety. It's a very interesting variety. It's a type of variety. I won't go into that, but then you can look, for example, at uh, the homology H2 with coefficients in Z. And if you do that, so this will be naturally polarized. So as a result, what you're going to get is you're going to get a map, you get a period map. from X to some period domain, which will be from, sorry, will be a map from the moduli space of cubic threefolds. So at point X will correspond to a point, which will be the homology of this final surface of lines on Z, uh, quotient by some group. Okay. So this is what we are going to get here. I don't really want to go over the full details, but what you also note is that uh, the way you construct this, there is still a mu3 or z mod 3 if you wish action here. So what you actually get is you get the map constructed by and discussed by Alcock, Carlson, and Toledo. What you're going to get is you're going to get a map from the moduli space of smooth cubic threefolds to a certain 10 dimensional ball quotient. Because this 10 dimensional ball quotient, uh, this uh, 10 dimensional symmetric space is a subspace of the 20 dimensional symmetric space into which you would be adding, uh, uh, which you would be mapping naturally, which is invariant under the action of Z mod 3. And you need to do the computations to check this exactly the dimension. So let me uh, make some remarks here. So, if you think about this, the dimension of the moduli space of abelian varieties of dimension five is 15, the complex dimension. This object is a 10 dimensional ball quotient. The dimension is 10. And the dimension of the moduli space of cubic three poles, we call this 10 again. So the intermediate Jacobian map is a map from the moduli space of smooth cubic threefolds to a 15 dimensional, much higher dimensional variety stack, metric space. Okay, so somebody is having trouble seeing what I'm writing. Is everybody else okay? No, no, it's okay. It's delay with the video, so it's fine. I think it's fine. Okay. I'll try to write more slowly then, so the delay is not so bad. If you look at this uh, Alcott Carlson Toledo period map, though, this is a map from a 10 dimensional moduli space of smooth cubic threefolds to a 10 dimensional target. And you can, of course, ask whether this map is generically injective or indeed injective. And part of the results of Alcott Carlson and Toledo is to say that this is indeed an injective map. So this is an embedding again. So this is an embedding of something 10-dimensional into something 10-dimensional. Here and both are irreducible. So this means they're birational, of course, right? And you can ask, what is the complement of the image? And we will indeed discuss this point a little bit later. So what I want to do now is I want to discuss the issue that the moduli space M of smooth cubic threefolds is not compact. If you go back, you see that, of course, what is the moduli of smooth cubic threefolds? It's a projectivization of the space of uh, cubic equations that define a smooth subvariety quotient by the action of PGL. But this condition that we define a smooth subvariety is an open condition, but the complement is some discriminant focus. So what this means is that the one, the first natural compactification you can consider is the compactification uh, via the GIT, you know, the geometric invariant theory. So there is a compactification of, of M given by GIT. So what you commonly write is you write this as the progressivization of H naught E4 or Here it's quotient by PGL. 
I will have much more to say about how this actually works. I won't review the geometric invariant theory for you, but I'll describe the geometry of this in more detail as we go along. So that's somehow the first uh, complexification you are naturally going to take probably for moduli of any hypersurfaces in any dimension of any degree, because this is always a situation where you can take the GIT complexification. So what does this complexification do? So geometric invariant theory tells you that you're going to add some other three folds, which are not necessarily smooth, but which are stable and semi-stable. And then uh, you will add the orbits of PGL5 action on such things. So you will add a collection of points. And you will see what this collection of points is, which is fine. And you will sort of know what they correspond to, but there is not going to be any reasonable universal family over this uh, GIT complexification because the points that you will add will correspond to some degenerations, but you will somehow be adding only the deepest points of some degeneration. So you can have some uh, points are semi-stable, some are strictly semi-stable, you'll get fully stable points. So somehow there will not be a universal family. And also the GIT complexification in general is going to be highly simple. And that's what you're going to see in this example as well, as we'll discuss. So this is a very natural complexification, but in some sense, maybe not necessarily the best complexification. Another thing you can do is you can take the Bailey Burrell complexification of a bulk ocean. So Bailey Burrell have described, described constructed complexifications of method domains in general. So in particular, there is a Bailey Burrell complexification of a bulk ocean. So what this is, is in a particular case of a bulk ocean, since the bulk ocean is not one, so this is uh, just the bulk ocean union, a finite collection of points. So all you have to do is just add a bunch of points in this particular situation. So what does this mean? If I think of this, this is a compact space, which is again, highly singular. Again, doesn't really have a reasonable universal family over it. I cannot hope that this would happen. And the way I obtain it is by taking the bulk ocean into which the modular space of smooth cubic three folds is embedded as an open dense subset. And I add furthermore a finite collection of points. So this is again a complex, I can think of this Bailey Burrell complexification of the bulk ocean model of the modular space of cubic three folds as a complexification of the modular space of cubic circles, and that's another complexification. Let me now try to explain to you why something difficult is going to happen. So I want to give you an example, and this is somehow the perhaps most interesting example, example of a singular but semi-stable cubic. Sam. Yes. Uh, can you also compactif uh, compactify in some compactification of A5? Uh, yes, we can, and I'll get to that in about uh, two minutes. So, yes, uh, so you can also, so uh, I, sorry, I'm sorry I couldn't recognize the voice, but I was asked uh, the following question. So, I can have an, I have an embedding of the modular space of cubic threefold into A5. A5 is not compact. So there are many complexifications of that that I will mention in a second. And I can consider a complexification of the modular space of cubic threefolds by compactifying the image of this map, by taking the closure of the image of this map in a suitable complexification of A5. And we'll do precisely that in a second, and I'll discuss that also. But I first want to uh, give you an example of an interesting singular cubic, if that's okay. Okay, so here is a chordal cubic. This, so is the, is is the uh, noted, yes? Hi, this, this Bailey Burrell complexification a priori doesn't have any geometric information of the, of the model of cubic. Like in particular, these uh, points that you add and even some of the stuff in this G10 quotient by gamma, uh, those are not a priori representing any cubic. So a priori, if you just have a symmetric domain of some of B10 mod gamma and you just add points, they correspond to some kind of degeneration of Hodge structures, if you wish, or something like that. If you're thinking about it this way, it doesn't allow you to say anything reasonable 
about a model interpretation of the cusps of this finite collection of points you are adding as a Bailey Borel complexity to anomaly called cusps. And it doesn't give you a, a way a priori to interpret these cusps in terms of uh, some degenerations of cubic three folds. And that's exactly the direction I'm going. So the, the direction I'm going is I'm trying to, uh, com we're going to try to compare these complexifications and get the better complexification and get some idea of what the geometry of this is and then get some properties. So a priori, if you just take a Bailey Barrel complexification, there is no reasonable family over it. So uh, for the case of Abil and Wright, as perhaps, so the points and the uh, complexifications, Bailey Barrel also called Sataki in this case, of the complexification of the modular space for billion varieties, the points on the boundary correspond to a billion varieties of lower dimension, which means there is no way you're going to be able to have any reasonable family where the fibers are going to drop dimension that doesn't happen. So a priori, this is sort of a, an arithmetic complexification. It comes from some arithmetic properties of group actions, not geometry. Okay? Again, I have to answer your question. Uh, yeah, great, thanks. Okay, so let me now give you an example. So here is a psi, which is a chordal cubic. I hope my handwriting remains readable. If not, you should complain. So I've just written down an equation, very simple. It's a determinant of a three by three matrix of linear forms. So of course, it's going to be a homogeneous degree three equation. Why is it called a chordal cubic? Well, because uh, even though I've written it this way, there is a different way to do it, uh, to think about it. So this is the space of secants, secants of rational normal curve. So the rational normal curve is when you map P1 by, well, I'll write the non-homogeneous coherence because I'm running out of space, but if you map P1 this way to P4, this is a so-called rational normal curve. So this is a curve that does something interesting in P4, and then you can take all sequence through that curve. So this means you take an arbitrary pair of points on this curve and you draw a line through that. So if you were doing this, what you're going to get is you're going to get a threefold, right? Because it, the sequence variety of a curve, you expect to be a threefold because you can pick an arbitrary pair of points on the curve, so that's two dimensions, and then there is a line for this to render the third direction dimension along this line. So this means you're going to get a threefold. I claim that's the threefold you get. What this means is that this threefold is going to be highly singular because of course this threefold is going to contain the rational normal curve that you started with and for every point there are many sequence. So you can easily convince yourself that the rational normal curve will be singular on the sequence threefold or the chordal cubic. And in fact uh, it is only way that the chordal cubic is singular. So the singular locus of the chordal cubic is the rational normal curve embedded in it. So notice that this is a threefold which is singular along the curve. So these are not isolated singularities. But you can check, and this is a, an easier enough di direct computation, that this is a semi-stable cubic in the sense of GIT. So this is to say that there will be a point in the modular space with GIT complexification, there will be a point corresponding to the coil cubic, which I will first denote by the side. Okay? So this is to convince you that there are interesting singular cubics that you will want to consider to do anything. Okay. So the study here, I, I, I remember that we need to get to A5, but there is the first theorem. Uh, so you have two complexifications, the GIT complexification and the bayley borel complexification of the bulk of it. So these are two complexifications of the same space, so they are birational, and you would like to know how to resolve this birational map. So the theorem of Casalino, Martin, and Laza says that you can resolve this rational map by rational map. So I'll, I'll stop writing dimension 10. So I'll just write B mod gamma, and I will never tell you what gamma is, but this is the bulk quotient that I have. Okay? So the theorem of Casalino, Martin, and Laza is that if you want to resolve the birational map of the GIT complexification, 
to the Bailey Burrell complexification of the bulk quotient model of the model after big free falls, then the theorem is the only thing you need to do is you need to blow one point in the GAT complexification, which is this coil physics, which is really why I wanted to introduce this coil physics. This is far from obvious, right? And this is some kind of coincidence. I haven't told you many of the details that go into this, which are really hundreds of pages of computations and work and interesting results by many people. Uh, in, in particular, you need to know what is the complement of the Moyla space of smooth cubic threefold, both within the GIT compactification and within the bulk closing model. And this was done by Olko, Carl, Sita, Levin, combinations, and by work of many other people. But what you can see so far is, in fact, that the GIT compactification of the modular space of smooth cubic simple and the Bailey Burrell compactification of this uh, bulk quotient model are not so far away. You can get from one to the other by just blowing up one point. So you blow up a point on the GIT compactification, and then there's a morphism to the Bailey Burrell compactification of the bulk quotient model. And I will tell you, moreover, uh, Jim. Uh, yeah? And uh, what is the exceptional divisor of this blow up? This is, this is a small modification. So the only thing that actually happens here is I have a curve that maps to a point. Uh, no, no, no. I, I was asking about the blow up of this special uh, cubic. So, okay, so the question is if I blow this up, can I identify this exceptional uh, divisor somehow geometrically? Here is your, and you have anticipated my next line, so that's excellent. So uh, this is about 12 points on P1. So let's call F psi the equation of the coil cubic. And I can take F psi plus epsilon times some other F, right? And if I perturb the coil cubic, if you believe me, which you have to, because I'm not going to prove it to you, that this is semi-stable, I can perturb it uh, in Anyway, and this will be uh, still a point in the MGIT. So suppose this is my cubic. Suppose I want to consider a cubic threefold, which is a small perturbation of the chordal cubic. So suppose this is going to be smooth. Generically, it's going to be smooth. So there is this equation. So this is going to be some smooth cubic x. And I would like to identify such cubic sex with some other geometric information. This would allow me to describe the exceptional divide. Of course, I won't do everything. But what you can do is you can, uh, you have this uh, rational nodal curve, let's call it C, okay? And I can take the rational nodal curve and I can intersect it with this cubic F, okay? So what is this going to be? So this is a degree four curve intersected with a cubic. So this is going to be 12 points on the rational normal curve. Okay. And in fact, you can see which will determine, and I'm using the word determine loosely, I don't want to get into the details of calculus and information and so on. F. So this means if you want to tell me a small infinitesimal deformation of the chordal cubic, then all you have to tell me is I have added some cubic and you should tell me how it intersects the rational normal curve. So this means that the exceptional divisor, the exceptional divisor of this blow up to MJT is M012, modular space of 12 points on, a, on P1, okay? Which is also the same as, well, sorry, not quite that, because it's at 12 unlabeled points, so I don't know which one is which, so it's a quotient by S12. So what this is, is this is just the modular space of hyperelliptic curves in, of genus phi. So the modular space of hyperelliptic curves of genus phi has dimension nine, as you can compute, the dimension of the space of 12 points in the line, so it's 12 minus 2. So this is a description of the exceptional divisor of this blower. Okay, did I answer the question? I wanted to do the same yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So this device, I, I would like to denote Z H for hyperelliptic, and this plays, of course, a major role in this. Okay. So so far, I haven't told you about any of the new work of uh, that I'm going to talk about. So this was a work of Sebastian uh, Martin and Rado Lada, I think, ten years ago or so. Uh, of course, they do much more, which I'm not covering. I'm going for some purpose. So what this allows us to do finally is to compare the GIT compactification of the modular cubic threefold and the Bailey Burrell compactification of the modular cubic threefold. And this is sort of a complete description of how this works. However, I'd like to indicate that in a way neither of these compactifications is optimal. We would like to sort of have a better compactification. What does better mean? Well, for example, you remember that there is an intermediate Jacobian map which sends a smooth cubic threefold to its intermediate Jacobian. And you can ask whether this map extends to a map of either of these compactification to a modular space of a billion variety suitably compactified. And this is the picture that I'd like to focus on now. Okay. So uh, let me try to explain what happens here. Uh, so I've, I've put letters in various places so that I can use them later, but uh, in the, on the bottom here, we have the moduli space of uh, uh, the GIT compactification of the moduli space. Okay, so this is our GIT compactification. And this is the Bailey Burrell compactification of the bulk ocean model. And what I've done for you now is I've described for you this resolution of the birational map. So the map phi, the map here, contracts the divisor to a point. Right? So there is this divisor, which is contracted to a point here. That's what this map does. The map in the other direction, I claim to contract the curve. I'll have more to say, and I'll tell you what this curve is. But you see that the map from this common resolution of the Bailey Burrell compactification of the bulk course into the, the GIT compactification does not, in fact, extend via the immediate sober map to a map. To, a compact, to any compactification of the modular space of five dimensional being right. So uh, there is a wonderful compactification that's constructed as some wonderful blow up, I won't tell you how, which is much bigger, which is smooth, has some reasonable universal family, more reasonable at least, with a scope. Excuse me, this uh, sorry, M twiddle. What is M twiddle? It does is I won't describe it for you because I don't want to go in that direction. But what it, it does, it has an isomorphism to the Sataki compactification of, a, uh, of uh, the modular space of principal polarized five dimensional mobile varieties. This is also a result of Casalina, Martin, and the other, where they have described the picture I have. What we then proved together with them and Klaus Kulik is that this wonderful compactification. Also, it's a map to a much richer toroidal, so called second Voronoi, or can take perfect tone, complexification of the modular space of five dimensional principle of polarized abelian variety. Why would that be interesting is because this Voronoi complexification of uh, modular space of principle of polarized abelian varieties was shown uh, by Alexeyev to admit a, reason of, a reasonable universal family. So, this is a way to say that somehow. Over this wonderful compactification, which I'm denoting M twiddle with a modular space of smooth cubic threefold, I will have a universal family of intermediate Jacobians suitably extended. Okay, so I have described all of this picture for you, except this curve on. So, what this curve on uh, compactification is, there is a procedure by curve to resolve. The singularities of a GIT compactification in full generality. So, if you have a GIT quotient, there is a curve of desingularization of that. And there is a procedure that I probably won't have much time to talk about that does this canonically. But you should know that this is what you can have. Okay. Uh, uh, so, there was a question in chat by Prakash, which is either specifically given or not, and I'm not sure I know well, that I understand what it means. Okay. So the curve and well, procedure is a desingularization, which somehow takes uh, the strictly semi stable loci of some sort and blows them up. 
in the C to the world. Okay, I will describe what this is. But the point is this curve and contraction. This curve, this curve, this curve cubic is uh, strictly for this table. Yeah. Could you repeat this? I couldn't hear. Uh, is the corner cubic the uh, strictly on each table? So the curve and compactification is a, a way to desingularize the GIT compactification. Right. There is a well defined mm -hmm. procedure. You start with a GIT problem, you get your GIT compactification, and there is a canonically given to you curve and desingularization. Which yeah, of so course, in particular, will not, the it will not touch the locus of smooth cubics, it will modify in some way, which I'm going to discuss, not at much length because I'll run out of time, uh, which modifies the loci in the GIT compactification that correspond to semi strictly semi stable cubic. I hope I've answered. So this theta is a strictly semi stable in particular, it's the first step of the Kirwan. I'm having lots of trouble yeah. hearing you, so maybe you could type the question in chat and then eventually. I'll answer it, but I wanted to go on, if you don't mind, to the main theorem. Uh, the, the, an the answer is yes, it is a polystable point. Okay, so thank you, Klaus. So Klaus apparently could hear the question better than I could. Um, I'm sure that Klaus answered it correctly. So this was Klaus for it. Okay. Okay, so these are the complexifications we have. So somehow the fact that you have this uh, mapped which extends the intermediate Jacobian map is a significant result requires work as far from obvious and it uses also uh, a relation of the modular space of cubics and this is immediate intermediate Jacobians with prims of double carvers of plane twin peaks, which is a whole other story and uh, I have given talks on, on the existence of this map in the past and that goes in a completely different direction. What I'd like to discuss now is the cohomology of the spaces we have. So I'm not going to talk about the uh, wonderful blow up. I'll focus just on the part of the picture, on this part of the picture. So I, I'll focus on this part of the picture. Okay. And here is our main result that I wanted to spend the rest of the talk discussing. So this is the theorem of Casalina Mars and Klaus Kuli, Pradulaz, and myself, where we compute the cohomology of all the things you've seen in that picture. I have to preface this by saying that when I say homology, I should be careful because the spaces are singular. And uh, what this means is I cannot really, well, I can consider homology, but it seems perhaps less natural to think about homology and more natural to think about intersection homology. So, what do we have in this picture? So let's go back. So this GIT compactification is singular. The bayley borel compactification of the bulk motion is also singular. The, the common resolution m hat is also singular. The curve and compactification, however, is smooth. It's not really smooth, it's a, it's a smooth stack. So this means when I'm going to compute homology, I'm certainly going to do it only with uh, rational coefficients because I have stacks and I don't really want to worry about integral coefficients. But also, I will only compute homology of the current compactification, and I will compute intersection homology of all the other compactifications you've seen. And this is the numbers. So the intersection homology, you may recall, satisfies this nice property that it has Poincaré duality for singularization, as does homology of compact smooth spaces. So you can see that the homology we compute for all of this, of course, satisfies Poincaré duality, and the view that we compute it, so it's not surprising. And you notice that there is no odd degree homology, which is not a priori obvious, because it's a, for a compact space, compact complex smooth space for the curve and blob, you could easily imagine there is some odd degree homology. It happens to vanish. Okay. So this are the numbers. Uh, why would you care about the numbers? Well, if you want to know anything about the geometry of the modular space of cubic three folds, you probably would want to know something about this number. So if you want to do a rational geometry, you should know the Picard number, while well, you would also want to know something about effective classes, non equal classes, net classes, and so on. So, all of that we are discussing, uh, we are going to address hopefully in some future papers, and, but there are many questions. If you want to consider some locus of cubic three folds that has some specific property, this is going to be a sub variety of the modular space of cubic three folds. Its compactification in any of these compactifications 
will then have some homology class and section homology class. So you would be able to try to identify it if you know this number. And we're happy we can just compute them. There is one other reason you might care about these numbers, and I will get to that uh, when I try to formulate a conjecture at the end of this one. Okay. So now uh, uh, I'd like to pause for a minute for questions, and then I'll try to describe a little bit more the geometry that you see and say a few words about how we proceed to compute this homology. So any questions so far? Uh, uh, can I ask about the map to A5 uh, Varanoi? Yes. Uh, so uh, does uh, the global Torelli theorem statement holds for the uh, corresponding abelian or quasi-abelian varieties? I mean, uh, is there some analog uh, like the statement that there is a single multiplicity three-point and... No. So uh, the, the, the map that I'm denoting IG Voronoi here contracts some boundary device of M3. Mm -hmm. So on, on the open part, it's an embedding, right? So inside here, I have the model of smooth cubic threefold, which maps to the model space of abelian right so dimension five and this is an embedding this is what the global trailer says but the map ig Voronoi contracts some boundary devices of m tweedle to higher quad dimension loci of a5 Voronoi. okay okay so it doesn't work you can uh, you can see what happens here but it, it doesn't work so you see this m tweedle is not the same as the closure in a5 Voronoi. it's something that admits a map to every compactification you can imagine, right? That's somehow it's useful. But then it's bigger because in different compactifications you expect to see different boundary pieces that can contract or enlarge. So right in different compactifications, different degenerations might correspond to a point or might correspond to a divisor. And if you have a compactification which maps to every compactification, then basically if from any point of view you see anything as a divisor, this compactification will see that as a divisor. So this compactification is somehow universal in the sense of the biggest natural compactification and it maps everywhere, but uh, it does not satisfy the global parallelism. Okay, any other question? Okay, so let me now try to describe a little bit uh, what the structure looks like. So uh, the point is, uh, to try to describe, I'd like to describe for you a little uh, what are the points of the GIT compactification of the modular space of cubic threefolds. And this is not new, this is due to Alcock. But basically, I mean, like this is not a precise statement, you should look at the paper, precise statement. It says a uh, singular cubic threefold is semi stable if it is either the coronal cubic or only has. Isolated singularities. So isolated singularities means a singular set is just a collection of points. And this a type of the singularities we might have is A1 to A5 and D4. And these are just names for local structures of singular points that I don't want to write. But this is some kind of list of singularities that are familiar to experts in singularity theory. So for me, semi-stable includes stable. So stable or semi-stable, if you wish, depending on your preferences for the language. This may be says stable or semi-stable. Okay. Moreover, the strictly semi-stable points. Of MGIT are as follows. This is also 
you know, is all the focal. Okay. So psi with the coil cubic. So what do I mean with strictly semi-stable points of MJT? So I'm enumerating, I'm describing for you the points that have a non-trivial stabilizer. So this is the singular points. So this are the singular points of MJT. So this is a quarter cubic, which we have seen. So the single log of the quarter cubic is the rational non proxy. Then there is one other point, one point that is the orbit of qubits with three D4 singularities. So since I didn't want to tell you what the D4 singularity is, I can just tell you what the defining equation is. So F delta is the equation x naught cubed plus x1 x2 x3 plus x4 cubed. So this is an undeniable cubic and you can check that it has precisely three singular points that have a maximum of course, has many interconnections. You can multiply x s naught by root of three, you can multiply x4, you can permute x1, x2, and x3, multiply them by roots of unity. So it has a large group of automorphisms. So it's a cubic with three D4 singularities. And it's uh, and what you get from this is just one point in the GIC compactification. So even though I'm not reviewing the GIC, let me say sort of the intuition of what happened. So I have written down a cubic for you which has three singular points, each of which is a D4 singularity. You can ask, why didn't I write down for you a cubic that has just one D4 singularity, which is easy to do, I could write down a question. Where did that go? So what it turns out, uh, what turns out to happen is if you have a cubic, which is singular, it has one D4 singularity. So the orbit of this cubic under the action of TGL5, the closure of this orbit will contain, excuse me, this cubic with three D4 singularity. And then when you are constructing the GAC complexification, all you need to do is you need to add the point corresponding to the a, cubic with three D4 singularities because the orbit of cubics with one D4 singularities is not closed. It's going to crash and then it's going to contain deeper orbits of cubics and the most you can have is three D4 singularities. So that's the way the JAT complexification works. And then there is a curve which is isomorphic to P1 of cubics with two A5 singularities. So again, I don't want to tell you what A5 singularities are, but I can tell you what is F, and this is called FAB, because there are two parameters. It's A X2 cubed plus X naught X3 squared plus X1 squared X4 minus X naught X2 X4 plus B X1 X3 X3. What is the purpose of me writing this? is because uh, for what we're actually doing, it's important to know this formula. So you actually do exclusive computation here. So you can check, and this is uh, some work, uh, that this cubic has uh, indeed two A5 singularities, except the following. So if the parameter that you have is actually 4A over B squared, so you know this by C, because if this parameter is the same for two such cubic, it's actually equivalent. So let this be our parameter. So if C is not zero and C is not one, the cubic has precisely two A5 singularities. If C is one, the cubic has two A5 singularities plus an A1 singularity. So which is not a problem. However, the important thing I want to write here is the following, that there is one case. So if, so if C is zero, this is the coil cube.
where c is zero, you can see what this means. Of course, that this term is not there. And then you can check this precisely the expansion of the quadrilateral cubic with some value of b, but then you can do a scale coordinates so it becomes precisely the quadrilateral cubic. So if I were to sketch for you in a very imprecise way, and you should of course never do this, uh, MGIT, so this is the way it's going to look. This is MGIT, which is a nice 10 dimensional space. Uh, yes. Uh, these are all the clothes. So, uh, Vanya has asked whether these are exactly all the semi stable cubes with infinite automorphisms. Uh, so, not, I'd like to postpone this question for two minutes. So, here is MJIT. So, here is one point which corresponds to. Uh, the 3D4 cubic, so I'll write this. Here is a curve which corresponds to cubics with 2A5 singularities. There is a peculiar point here which corresponds to 2A5 on the next one, A1 singularity, but if you know that, but there is also the chordal cubic which lies here. Okay? And what I've drawn here is a singular locus of the GIT complexity. So there's a singular locus of the GIT complexification, the molar space is pretty simple. So a point and a line. Right. Uh, Sam, and, and where is the curve that is contracted to the Bailey Borel compactification? You are guessing about one minute ahead of me, so please wait. Okay? So you'll see it exactly. That's exactly where I'm planning to enter by this picture a little bit more. So how does curve and desingularization work? How does curve and desingularization work? It tells you that the way you think of this is this delta, I mean, this is one point in the GIT, but this is the entire, this corresponds to the entire orbit of cubics with a 3D4 singularity. So this is bad curve and tells you, you should replace it by a divisor. So you blow this up. So the curve and blow up, the curve and desingularization is essentially you would like to say that you're going to blow up the point and you're going to blow up the curve, but you also want to blow up the chordal cubic. And then you see that uh, if you try to do it naively, first of all, you should be doing this equivariantly because you probably want to do some equivariant blow up before you take an action by PDL5. But you should also be very careful in which order you do a blow up because you really want to blow up a point lying on a curve. Right, and you better know whether you first want to blow up the point and then want to blow up the strict transform of the curve, or the other way around, or what are you doing? So the correct procedure is, in fact, that you want to first blow up the point. So let me admit now, as answer, as partial answer about automorphism group. So the automorphism group the automorphism zero, so the connected component of the automorphism zero of the 3D4 is C star squared. The automorphism group of a point on T, so this is a 2A5 cubic. The connected component is C star. And finally, the automorphism group of the chordal cubic is PGL. Because you can pick the rational normal curve, and there is a PGL PC that fits in that, and of course, it's going to fit the coil field. And this is the only three possibilities. So, the way curve and arranges a desingularization is uh, if it goes uh, by dimension of the stabilizer, and you should be starting by blowing up the things with the largest dimension of the stabilizer in a suitable equivariant way. So, what C actually defines is a correct equivariant complexification of the whole space. Okay? And this is how you blow up. Okay, let me now try to answer the question about what happens in all the pictures. So uh, here is a picture of what happens to the uh, chordal cubic. So this is, a, I've drawn a picture of what happens to the chordal cubic in all compactifications. So in the GIT compactification down below, it's just one point. In this M hat, it's resolved to a divisor. This divisor is mapped down to a divisor 
in the Bailey Burrell compatibility. And as I said before, the exceptional uh, the locus of this map of this resolution is precisely this divisor. This divisor is already blown up in this M hat, which actually tells us the curving compactification factors for this blow up. This is the first blow up of the curving construction effect. So we are going to still have a divisor here. Okay. Then if you go to this wonderful compactification, then you'll still have this divisor there. I put a little to indicate I blow it up. Now this will map to the hyperelliptic locus in a fire form as well suitable for that. That's one story. Next story is about what happened to the curve. So the curve of two A5 singularities, right? So the curve of cubics is two A5. Well, the curve here, its strict transform is still a curve, right? It's a curve that contains the point that I blow up. That's the smooth point where I blow it up. I just get one point on the strict transform. So it's still a curve. Let's call it C. Well, maybe half would be a better notation. And that's precisely the curve that gets blown down to one of the two dividers of the Bailey Burrell compactification. And if I do the curve and desingularization further, this will give me a divisor in the curve and compactification, which I'll denote as D2A5 because it obviously corresponds to cubic with D2A5. And finally, there is this point where I have a 3D4 singularity. This, for this point, nothing happens. Near this point, the map from the JIT compactification to the Bailey Burrell compactification does nothing, it seems, right? It maps a point to one of the cusps, and then it gets blown up to a device on the curve and blow up. So, did I answer the question of what the exceptional loss of all the maps are? So, let's get back to our picture. So, so the theorem we prove is uh, the dimension of the space of homology spaces of everything you see here. And how do you do that? Well, curve and machinery actually tells you how to compare homology of the curve and blow up and the GXC compactification, and how to compare uh, and how to compute the homology of the curve and blow up, provided you can describe explicitly geometrically every single unstable locus you ever encounter, every single semi-stable locus you have encountered, provided you solve the JIT problem from the tangent spaces uh, that, that to the uh, exceptional losses that you are blowing up. Provided you can do all of that, there is some machinery that in principle allows you to do it. Except uh, if you know that there is a machinery, you have to do many computations and you have to classify everything you see and you have to know that this will actually work. And uh, if you start doing this, there's no guarantee that this will work. In this case, Luckily, from the work of many people and with another eight pages or so of computations, you can make this work. And then you get the result. And so this is how you get the homology of the curve and blow up from curve and machine, and this is how you get the homology of the GIT complexification. Okay. Then, of course, you know that this um, intermediate compactification of the resolution of the map is the first step of the curve and blow up, and the curve and machinery also allows you compute its homology, so you'll be able to do that. And then uh, to compute the homology of the Bailey Burrell compactification, you, what you do is you have to describe the exceptional divisors of the map from the curve and blow up there, which you know exists. You compute the homology and you use the decomposition theorem and you compute the intersection homology of the Bailey Burrell compactification. And that's how it works and this is what we've done, but there is one other thing I want to tell you. Let me go back the picture here. So I didn't really tell you how to define the wonderful compactification, but let me tell you that if you're familiar with symmetric spaces, this was a Bailey Burrell compactification, which you know is not the best compactification you can have. You can also have a toroidal compactification, okay? which is a resolution of singularities, or maybe a partial resolution you need to think of the Bailey Burrell compactification. So this is the bulk ocean. So a toroidal compactification is reasonably easy. So as you may have seen in the notes I've shown, this Bailey Burrell compactification has two cusps. So there are two points, which are the two points you've added to go from the bulk ocean to the Bailey Burrell compactification. And what the toroidal compactification does is it introduces a divisor for each of these two cusps. 
So in here, I'm going to have three divisors. The divisor corresponding to qubits is two and five singularities. The divisor of qubits is three D four singularities, which are the two cusps. And I have already here the divisor of uh, the strict transform and the image of the uh, uh, divisor, which is the pre-image of the coil qubit. So I have three divisors here. And inside here, I have similar three divisors. So somehow the enumeration of divisors of the curve and blow up and of the toroidal compactification is the same. And what we did is we actually computed also the dimension of homology of the toroidal compactification. Okay, and I will write numbers. Uh, very quickly, I'm, you notice I'm not looking at my notes and I'm doing this, or maybe you don't know it, but trust me, I'm not. The reason I know how to write them is uh, the same as the homology of the curve and blow up. So in the picture, I have two smooth compactifications, the royal compactification and the curve and blow up, and they turn out to have the same homology. The way we do this is we describe very explicitly the royal compactification by actually just looking at the lattices and describing the dividers and computing their homology and using the decomposition theorem again. So you have two smooth compactifications, for example, they have the modular space of cubic circles, the curve and blow up and the toroidal compactification. And they turn out to have the same homology. And of course you would want to know whether they actually have the same compactification. And yes, we'd like to conjecture that this is maybe the case, but at some point when we saw this, we were very confident of this conjecture. At this point, we're much less confident, but uh, I think we're still confident of the good question. So somehow we're in a situation where we have two very natural complexifications with a modular space of cubic circles, which somehow are stratified in the same way, and which have the same homology, and the total space and the exceptional device have the same homology. But of course, it doesn't mean that this is the same complexification, which would be good. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, excellent talk, and uh, please ask questions now. Uh, uh, can I ask you, uh, uh, what is the exceptional divisor uh, over uh, the point delta in the Kirwan resolution? It's an exceptional divisor over the point, point delta. From the Kirwan description, it's not uh, so particularly easy to see what it is geometrically. You can try to see what it is, but it's not so easy. I can tell you more easily in principle what the exceptional divisor is uh, over the point delta uh, in the toroidal compactification of the bulk ocean. So if you think about the toroidal compactification of the bulk ocean, then the divisor delta will be some product of elliptic curves, of nine elliptic curves, nine special elliptic curves where, which have a Z mod 3 action, quotient by some group. And uh, we have described it what this is. And that's what the structure of the divisor is. From the curve and picture, we also see some description, but it's not quite as explicit. Uh -huh. Any other questions? And what about the exceptional divisor over the curve tau? So again, in the toroidal compactification, it's some product of elliptic curves quotient by some group, which we ex describe explicitly. From the point of view of curve and um, computations, you don't really see the divisors this way. What you're doing is you have this uh, in P34, in the space of all cubic equations, you can see there's a locus of those cubics that have a 2A5 singularity, that's some high dimensional locus, I forget the dimensions, just taking in the paper. And then you're describing the normal bundle to that, and then uh, you're taking the quotient, I mean, you're taking the GIT quotient of the action of the stabilizer, which is the star, from this normal bundle. So you somehow get a description of this as some uh, GIT quotient, which you can work through, but you start by uh, asking what is the whole uh, space of cubics with a 2A5 singularity. So it seems possible to match up the geometric description and see that this is also the product of elliptic curves portion by group, but I'm not sure we have done it fully. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And you said this only works over C. Uh, can't you put this in families and descend it as some more diagram of stacks over Q, maybe? 
maybe i have no idea right many of the techniques that go here are c specific so the, uh, the analysis of stability and semi-stability of cubics i only know of over c the git of other fields um, there are some issues you may worry about uh, bailey barrel compactifications of course work over other bases as well i don't know i mean so our computations for all of this work explicitly in local coherence over c and i don't my, i'm not sure that Kervin's machinery works over other fields i'm unaware of any statements to that effect but i may be unaware thank you sam i have small question so for example cubic surface has two siblings like uh, del pets of degree one and del pets of degree two so cubic mm -hmm. threefold also has two siblings uh mm -hmm. threefold of degree one and del pets of degree two double cover of p3 ramified and quartic and the Veron double cone of the veronese cone yeah. anything similar for them good question well, let's start with del peso surfaces so i mean i told you the story for cubic three folds there is a similar story for cubic surfaces of course mm -hmm. which is simpler and the results we get are the same i mean sorry we compute the homology um, most of this was done but again there is a toroidal compactification uh, the curve and the homologists agree and we again don't know whether they agree uh, whether you can do this for del pesos i'm not sure so one I mean, this is heavily gat dependent and this depends on knowing the JIT geometry fully, sort of explicitly. You need to describe all the semi-stable loci explicitly and classify them and classify stabilizers and all that. And this works for cubic surfaces, cubic threefolds. I don't know how much can be said for delta S's. I have to admit I haven't thought about this. I don't know, maybe Klaus has some comments or maybe some other of my collaborators have comments. I haven't thought about this. So our next thought was well certainly we can prove that these two compactifications are the same let's do that and then that hasn't yet happened so we were thinking in a different direction but good question more questions the the jt compactification of cubic threefold coincides with the k stable uh, sorry, capable stable compactification of, of k stable three for the one admitting the last symmetry. Hmm? Uh, is there a relation to this? So, if I heard the question correctly, which I'm not fully sure I, I did, uh, so I mean, there is also a uh, work by Liu and Xu uh, who describe the k stable uh, the compactification of the one that's cubic threefold from the point of view of k stability, and it coincides. With the GIT, I think, right? Mm -hmm. But then uh, I don't know how to approach this. So uh, the K stability machinery doesn't seem to give you a way to compute homology, right? And somehow their result, I think, is extremely interesting. I'm not quite sure how to relate it to what we've been doing here. So, yes, I'm very glad that we have computed the, um, the homology of the K stable compactification of the modular of cubic three folds. I could have named one of that one of the spaces that but i don't really know how to marry this machinery with the machinery we're, doing, we're using okay uh, if there are no more questions let's thank uh, sam again uh, for a beautiful talk and uh, sam thank you very much you can actually uh, clap and uh, zoom like this yeah. Thank you, and uh, I'll record the, the video and I'll upload it uh, in an hour, in a few, half an hour. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, buddy.